How to Survive a Pandemic by John Hudson. The United Kingdom's military's chief survival instructor. Life Lessons for Coping with COVID-19 From the acclaimed How to Survive From the acclaimed author of How to Survive When it comes to survival, listen to this man, Levison Wood John Hudson, How to Survive a Pandemic Life Lessons for Coping with COVID-19 Show me a man who, though sick, is happy. Who, though in danger, is happy. Who, though in prison, is happy. And I'll show you a stoic. Epictus. Since my book, How to Survive, was first published, I've been contacted by many readers who found its advice helpful in their early in their daily lives and challenges. From those working in offices to members of the emergency services and also everyday folk battling awful things like cancer and PTSD. Since the beginning of March 2020, readers have also reached out to me to ask for some practical advice that will help during the coronavirus disease, COVID-19 pandemic. I hope you find the additional material here useful. John Hudson, March 2020. The shock of a new life-changing moment can happen at any time and anywhere. Not just in the extreme world, but life-changing moments can also happen more gradually. And as we've seen with the current pandemic, it can be no less of a shock when the realization comes. And as we've seen throughout this book, accepting this and taking responsibility increases your ability to tolerate hardship and to restart your perseverance engine. This is key to your survival mindset and one of the greatest skills to develop in life. Know your enemy. If survival means staying alive, Viruses raise a fundamental issue because they themselves survive by leading a kind of borrowed life. By understanding what a virus is, we can make sure any borrowing of our lives or our loved ones' lives as host is avoided or is as temporary as possible. Viruses are small strands of genetic material that rely on infecting other living cells in order to reproduce. Once in there, they build replicas of themselves and then break out of that cell to find lots more cells to repeat the process, either in that host body or another one. When viewed under an electron microscope, we can see that their genetic material is surrounded by a ring of protein spikes which looks like a crown. The Latin word for crown is corona. It's these protein spikes that allow the virus to anchor onto living cells and infect them. There are many types of coronaviruses, from the common cold to pneumonia, to even more severe variants that attack the respiratory system. The corona family of viruses are carried by animals and can sometimes make their jump to humans in a spillover. While several known coronaviruses are circulating in animals and have not yet infected people, the COVID-19 virus was first identified as spilling over to humans in late 2019 in Wuhan, China. After comparing the new virus's genetic material with 217 similar types, scientists in China, China think that this one made the leap from bats to humans, probably via snakes. Bats and snakes were on the sale at Wuhan Animal Market. How does COVID-19 work? The COVID-19 virus, or SARS-CoV-2, is transmitted by droplets typically emitted when an infected person coughs or sneezes. A single cough can produce up to 3,000 droplets. Researchers at the U.S. National Institutes of Health found that the COVID-19 virus could survive for up to three hours after being coughed out. 
fine droplets can remain airborne for several hours in still air. They also found that it can survive on cardboard for up to 24 hours and up to two to three days on plastic and stainless steel. The kinds of materials that surfaces like light, switches, and ATM keypads are made from. There is also evidence suggesting that it can be transmitted by fecal matter, meaning that shared laboratories and associated handles could harbor droplets containing the virus. You become infected by breathing in someone's cough or sneeze, or by touching a surface with droplets containing the virus, and then transferring that to an entry point like your eyes, nose, or mouth by hand contact. Studies have shown that humans touch their faces up to 23 times per hour. Once the virus infects a person, it can take days until illness symptoms occur, which is probably one of the reasons why COVID-19 has been able to spread so quickly and widely. When someone does start to fall ill, the symptoms range from mild to severe and normally include fever, your body's immune system attempting to make you less hospitable to a virus by turning up the thermostat. Respiratory effects like a dry cough, the virus initially replicates inside the cells of the host nasal passage and the back of their throat, or a shortness of breath. Once established in the throat, the virus moves down the bronchial tubes to the lungs. In severe cases, there's been pneumonia, organ failure, and death. With a rapid to a severe pneumonia and a respiratory failure normally happening in the first week. Respiratory failure here is down at the fundamental level. It's the prevention of oxygen transferring from your alveola, tiny air sacs in your lungs, to your bloodstream. These sacs become filled with fluid by the effects of the virus and stop working. The fatality rate varies due to many factors and is therefore hard to gauge. But the latest estimates have it around 1%, although this proportion rises with age, reaching 15% in the over 80s. As some of the mild symptoms can appear like other seasonal illnesses, in order to diagnose that someone actually has COVID-19, a test called PCR, polymerase chain reaction needs to be done, which can identify the virus's genetic fingerprint. At the time of the, of the writing, there is no specific medical treatment or preemptive vaccine available, just supportive care. But scientists globally are working around the clock to identify weaknesses in the COVID-19 virus from how it attaches to our cells through the ways of inhibiting its reproduction and spread. You can understand and adapt. No, you know how this, now you know how this particular virus spreads and works. You can fully appreciate the reasons behind advice that's given by professionals in disease prevention like the World Health Organization. As we saw in Chapter 5 of How to Survive with Captain Bly's successful crossing of over 4,000 miles of ocean in an open boat, when you know how, why you should do something, because you understand the principles at play, you're much more likely to stick to the right course of action and thereby achieve your biggest goals. This is why it is so important to always get your information from the most credible source of facts and guidance when you can. In this current case, the World Health Organization. Try where you can to have more than one way to access information too. During large social upheavals, key infrastructures like power, internet, and mobile networks can get overwhelmed. Your nearest TV transmitter is probably still working, though. Why not check if you can still pick up a signal if all the streaming services stop? If all else fails, an old school radio that runs from batteries will pick up news updates. There may also be a radio fitted in your car. Know yourself how to defend your vulnerabilities. The next step to dealing with your pandemic is to understand what practical steps to formulate in your own plan to stay safe. Regardless of the nature of the threat, the principles and the survival remain the same. Plan, protection, location, acquisition, navigation. See Chapter 2 and Emilia Earnhardt's Desert Island for the full story. It's still the key to your priorities in a scenario like a pandemic. That means the first thing you need to do is to run through the what 
will harm me first. Where are the biggest threats question? There is a role, a huge role, that taking responsibility for personal protection plays here. And in the case of a pandemic, when you take the right steps to protect yourself, of course you're also protecting others. In the case of COVID-19, humans are now the main vectors for this disease. And an infected person may not display symptoms while unwittingly carrying the virus. This is why the WHO, World Health Organization, recommends wherever you can to avoid agglomerations, groups of other people, and specifically also the kinds of places and venues where other people are closed in together. If you have to venture into areas with other people, try to keep at least one meter away from them. But doubling this WHO advice to two meters whenever you can, as the UK government suggests, would be even better. As important as it is, there's no need to be rude about this social distancing. We are a civilized society, and the grease that makes its wheels turn is good manners and mutual respect. We are all in this together, so smile, because in the long term, the virus will pass, and we will get back to normal, and you wouldn't want to fall out with people over a perceived lack of good manners. Respiratory etiquette. After returning from London, as the pandemic was starting to flicker on our collective concern meter a friend of mine jokingly observed that on the tube, you used to have a hide a fart with a cough. These days, it's the other way around. The key is to prevent the release of the virus droplets into the air, and that's why we need to catch them in a tissue and dispose of it safely. The World Health Organization recommends into a Ziploc bag if there are no closed waste bins available. Coughing and sneezing without covering was never right, but now that is true. Harm is much more widely known. Unhindered coughs and sneezes are thankfully again a real social taboo. We can restrain ourselves to behave differently. If you've got a tissue, the crook of your bent elbow will stop coughs and sneezes blasting into the atmosphere. But you're reading this because you're survival-minded. So you will have prepared for this and have some tissues, right? Afterwards, you need to clean your hands. That will stop any of your germs transferring into surfaces that others may touch. This hand cleaning advice holds for others times you may have touched a surface that could have droplets on it too. If you've successfully avoided inhaling droplets by social distancing, it would be a pity to touch your eyes, nose, or mouth if they're transferred into your hands by contact and let the virus in that way. If you know you have to enter a high-risk zone like a public toilet or, or the patrol station, Handling the pumps is something that you may not have already thought about. You can further protect yourself by using one of your tissues as a disposable barrier when you have to touch handles, etc. Hand hygiene. When your hands are visibly dirty, the best way to clean them is by washing with soap and water. Normal soap, the yardstick of civilization, works by helping the water to remove the particles from your hands not by killing the germs that are now hiding out in the natural oils on your skin. Soap molecules work by making the oil particles, now containing pathogens, bond with water so they will rinse off together. Think of soap like loads of tiny chemical magnets, one end sticking to oil and the other end sticking to water, forcing two things that would normally not join up to bond together. Soap is very good at its job of distancing you from potential harmful microorganisms, but mechanically removing them by soap hand washing takes time, and that's why you need to be thorough. The World Health Organization recommends you spend 40 to 60 seconds doing it. Alcohol-based hand gels can't cut through lots of muck and grease, which is why soap and water is better if your hands look dirty. However, even if they look clean, your hands will have a large 
huge numbers of tiny organisms on them, and some of which could be the COVID-19 virus. Alcohol is a solvent for your natural skin oils that the germs are sticking to and works slightly differently. When the concentration of alcohol in hand gels is over 60%, there is enough alcohol for it to also destroy the outer protein shell of the virus, which will kill it. This takes a little less time than washing with soap. The World Health Organization recommends hand gels be rubbed on your hands for 20 to 30 seconds. Make sure you apply enough in the first place, too. It should say how much on the label. And do always check the label. You need to know that there is at least 60% alcohol content. Otherwise, it's not going to kill the virus. How to avoid touching your face. It's really hard to restrain Retrain yourself not to touch your face. In the past, I've seen jungle survival instructors with machetes in their hands instinctively swat at mosquitoes. Even when you are trying not to touch your face. It happens before your conscious brain can override it. As we discussed in Chapter 1, when we looked at your brain's prehistoric, pre-programmed shortcuts. But as we also saw there, we can reprogram our brains to react differently, to override our instinctive reactions through a process of practical practice drills. Other than when we scratch itches, we touch our faces for a variety of reasons. Studies have shown them to include self-soothing, and that skin-to-skin -skin contact can release a hormone called oxytocin, which increases a feeling of calm. And if we're mindful of those reasons, we can intercept our hands en route to our faces. More practically, if you know you have a habit of touching your eyes, perhaps when you're tired, wear sunglasses. If you know you stroke your beard when you think, you could sit on your hands or put them in your pockets. If you need to scratch an itch, try using the back of your arm instead of your hands. As we covered in the details about pilot emergency drills in Chapter 1, this is reach training your behaviors to have a specific appropriate response and is far more appropriate and effective than just being told don't do that unconscious thing that you do but all these hacks take time to embed and you'll never fully eliminate the chance of an unguarded moment so keep washing your hands personal protective equipment a good way to stop your hands physically touching your mouth or nose is to wear a face mask the World Health Organization recommends that anyone with symptoms should wear these facial barriers and also anyone caring, caring for an ill person. Some shops are now insisting that customers cover their faces with scarves as well as distancing themselves from other shoppers. But remember, they cannot stop all viruses. The best protection, shelter in place. That's right, in your place, not at the seaside or as had been seen in the UK with unthinking people crowding together at beauty spots, but at your home. This is a pandemic, not a bank holiday. Remember, you could have the virus, but not yet have the symptoms. Anyone who goes out to agglomerations unnecessarily can pass the virus to two or three others, who can in turn spread it to two or three others, and repeat until the healthcare system collapses and vulnerable people die who couldn't, who could have lived by simply staying at home. Never can so many do so much for the few. Coping with indefinite isolation. The most effective action we can take is to be responsible and stay at home, but it is, does not come without challenges because aside from being social creatures, our species doesn't like uncertainty. Researchers at the University College of London proved this by measuring the sweat and pupil size of people playing a game where the prize for finding a snake Behind a rock was a small electrical shock. What they discovered in their study was that we are more stressed if we are uncertain whether a shock is coming than if we, are, if we know we are going to get zapped. As we saw with a stealth fighter pilot, Del Zelko, in Chapter 1, you need to create a what-if strategy to make coping with the unexpected easier. Expect to be zapped. Doing this can't provide you with all the answers. 
but it can retrain your brain to avoid being overwhelmed by the unexpected and to think more clearly when some new challenge presents itself. You can further reduce your stress by limiting the amount of time that you spend scrolling for news through bottomless social media feeds. If you want to know concrete facts rather than vested opinions, go to the info sources like health officials and disease prevention agencies. It would be advisable to limit yourself to one or two news reports per day rather than it rolling on indefinitely on a screen. As we saw in my chapter on invasion, social media and even rolling news programs are all designed to be extremely addictive. We should reframe the situation psychologically by not continuously monitoring our shelter-in-place screens and windows for threats, but by seizing the time it gives us as an opportunity to be usefully creative. Shakespeare supposedly wrote King Lear during the plague lockdown. This is, hopefully, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to spend some uninterrupted time trying something new. So just get started and see what you can achieve. Far better to look back on the first draft of your first novel when the pandemic has passed than to wonder why you chose to watch every series on Netflix. There are some groups who are experts in these isolation scenarios from whom we can learn some useful tactics. Before automation, lighthouse keepers used to work in teams of three, each taking their turn on watch. Stints of time spent alone monitoring the light and fighting off sleep. The way they would start each period of duty would be by having a half an hour chat with the keeper going off watch. The off going keeper really wanted to get their head on a pillow and sleep, but they knew they also had the responsibility to help their colleague who just got out of bed to become alert. So they would brew them a big pot of tea and share it over a natter. If you know of any vulnerable friends or relatives who are stuck home alone, be a light keeper and give them a call. And if you can, a video call will help you actually see them and read their gestures. Not only will they feel more connected, but you will keep an eye out for them and make sure they aren't struggling to cope. When off watch and not sleeping, all lighthouse keepers had a hobby. You don't want to kill time during this unexpected window of opportunity. You want to spend it well. What's a great hobby to choose? By choosing reading, you've chosen one of the best ways to reduce stress. It was found to be 68% better at reducing stress levels than listening to music, 300% better than going for a walk, and 700% more than playing video games. And if you choose some nonfiction books to read, it could be that you learn something new, too. If reading isn't what your family are into, longer podcasts can be a brilliant way to dial into the conversations of interesting, inspirational people. Online learning courses are also a great use of this time gift. Many are available with audio feeds if you want to limit screen or sitting hours. You could also make things with your hands, like finishing that do-it-yourself task that you've had no time to do before, or something with a more tangible reward like setting up some home brew. Looking at best practices from which we can learn how to cope better with isolation. Another group who are very well adapted to not being able to nip out for a coffee are the astronauts of the International Space Station. Long periods in close proximity to others is not just about being with the right people, it's about being the right person yourself. As Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield says, these days, NASA looks for a certain type of person, someone who plays well with others. Interestingly, Chris thinks he gained a lot of insight into teamwork and playing well with others doing his survival training. When you are dependent on the few people around you and your joint initiative, really, success really is a team sport. Establishing a routine where any unpleasant tasks are shared equally and sometimes dedicated to personal space will help this. 
And as we saw in chapter 5, where we looked at the importance of other people in survival, remaining good-humored is a massive asset and directly in your power to control. Think of this current situation you are in as your own survival training. It can be tough in the moment, but afterwards, I reckon we will look back and appreciate the lessons we learned. When I come back from the Arctic, I always enjoy the spring sunshine more than I used to. When home from the jungle, it's great not to have to check for leeches before bed. After this pandemic, I know I'll really appreciate the regained freedom to mooch to the pub. And we're all less likely to take life's simple pleasures for granted. By following these simple guidelines, You'll have a plan ready for my any enforced period of self-isolation in the future, added to which you won't become collateral damage in any uncool fight over toilet paper. To panic or to prepare. Toilet paper, panic buying, is the perfect metaphor for the combination of unhelpful rumor and inappropriate behavior. Normal society runs on good behavior, but it only needs one selfish person to take more than they need just in case and a domino effect of panic buying ensues. To the point where people are mass buying anything they can get their hands on, not even knowing why they needed so much toilet paper. What was slightly comic to watch at first very quickly leads to serious consequences. When it leaves healthcare workers coming off eye-reddening long shifts to find that they can't even buy fruit and vegetables and the kind of food that they can, that they, more than anyone, need to stay healthy. Call it what you like. Panic buying, F-O-M-O, the tragedy of the commons. It's antisocial, antisocial, selfish, and wrong. We are in this together. There is no need for people to behave like we're an idiocracy. We can choose how we respond to any challenge. If you witness yourself, if you witness selfish types overstocking the traditional British response and denouncement of all socially unacceptable conduct is a well-aimed tut. But given these exceptional circumstances and knowing that this behavior has already impacted hard-pressed emergency services and healthcare professionals, why not really signify how inappropriate panic buying is as a community response and ask the pusher of the overloaded trolley if they really need that much toilet paper? If everyone takes a stance, it should be put back on the shelves and balanced for all. Again, it's about being polite, confident, and taking individual responsibility for the whole team. So how can you avoid being affected by that kind of reactionary nonsense in the future? In the short term, your local shops and smaller stores might still have what you need. Bigger superstores seem to get stripped out first. And if it's available where you live, online shopping is a great alternative in these conditions. In the longer term, once all the dust from the COVID-19 settles, you'll want to plan to weather any future social storms. Unless you're prepping for Doomsday, the sequence and stats from Chapter 2 about what your body actually requires to hold true, still hold true. To summarize and generalize, if you can't breathe or are bleeding heavily, time to death is in minutes. Uninjured at extremes of temperature, it's in hours. Without any drinking water, death takes days. And without food, weeks. So there really is no need to bury a container with a ton of rice and grenades in the woods. Remember that things like a good first aid kit are top of your list. Then ways to protect yourself physically, including perhaps a face mask or two, to maintain your body temperature, and importantly, to stay informed. Many people don't know what mode that batteries to power radios. And torches will have a use-by date, 
So check them every so often. A good routine is whenever you change the clocks in spring or autumn. You will need to clean drinking water more than food to have a couple of options to make your own. The next event could see people panic buying bottled water too. Boiling water is the best way, but purification tablets can be bought online, are cheap, and take up hardly any space. If you aren't one of the few who can harvest what they need to eat from the great outdoors all year round, then get some unperishable food that won't attract pests. How much you store is up to you. But you shouldn't need tons and no more than 30 days worth based on minimal activity. Again, you'll need to keep an eye on use-by dates. So write these on the tops of cans and packets in bold before you store them under your stairs to make that task easier. Knowing you have it reduces the mental pressure of seeing people panic by on the news. If you do find yourself making odd or impulsive decisions, it may be a sign that you need to rebalance yourself and regain some perspective. As we saw at the beginning of the book, a well-stocked and well-functioning brain is the best survival tool anyone can have. What now? How we deal with adversities defines us. If you're feeling more stressed than usual, that is understandable in these unprecedented, uncertain times. But everything can be dealt with, with the right mindset and techniques. If you feel overwhelmed, breathe. The breathing technique in Chapter 1 will help. And as we saw with the amazing escape of the three Aussie air crew in Chapter 4, breaking any task down into smaller, achievable chunks is the key to maintaining hope. Hope allows you to plan for the future, which in turn gets you started in tackling the issue and also spins up a positive feedback loop your own engine of perseverance. We can learn from the stoic philosophy of Jim Stockdale, who spent over seven years in Hanoi Hilton Prison during the Vietnam War after his jet was shot down, mentally dividing things into those you can control and those you can't control will, will reduce your worries. He knew the works of ancient philosophers like Epictus by heart, and he endured unimaginable hardships in actual physical and mental isolation by employing their core ideas daily, hourly, at the heart of survival of any situation. From the most mundane to extreme, from the known to the completely novel, like the current pandemic, the key is to think like a stoic, to accept the circumstances, understand the controllable and the uncontrollable, and the difference between the two, and adapt your mindset accordingly. Humankind has been presented with challenges for as long as civilization has existed. And Epictus got it right when he talked about the stoic's mindset nearly 2,000 years ago. And remember... You have been gifted some time at home. Just a simple act of reading this has reduced your stress and I hope given you some ideas and motivation. The conditions are ripe to gain new knowledge and skills for the future. Good luck. Be sure to check out John Hudson's Lessons for Everyday Life. From the Extreme World, a brilliant, brilliant book. Chris Evans. How to Survive by John Hudson. The United Kingdom's military's chief survival instructor. Footnotes, Google, T-E-O-T-W-A-W-K-I, if you're curious.
remembering that hack from chapter 5 of using a pencil to help you feel happy. Notes As quoted in Stockdale J, 2001, Stockdale on Stoicism 2, Master of My Fate, U.S. Naval Academy, Center for the Study of Professional Military Ethics. 2, Scientific American, Are Viruses Alive? 3, New Scientists, We're Beginning to Understand the Biology of the COVID-19 Virus. 4, World Health Organization, Coronavirus. 5. New scientists, Wuhan coronavirus may have been transmitted to people from snakes. 6. New England Journal of Medicine, Aerosol and Surface Stability of SARS-CoV-2. As compared with SARS-CoV-1. Nature Medicine, Characteristics of Pediatric SARS-CoV-2 Infections and Potential Evidence for Persistent Fecal Viral Shedding 8. BBC How to Avoid Touching Your Face So Much 9. CNN Infected People Without Symptoms Might Be Driving the Spread of Coronavirus More Than We Realize 10. New York Times What Does the Coronavirus Do to the Body? 11. New Scientists why is it hard to calculate how many people will die from COVID-19? 12. World Health Organization. Open. World Health Organization. Online courses. Emerging respiratory viruses, including COVID-19. Methods for detection, prevention, response, and control. HTTPS. Semicolon slash backward slash backward slash. Open WHO dot org backward slash courses backward slash I N T R O D U C T I O N slash dash T O dash N C O V New Scientist we're beginning to understand the biology of the COVID-19 virus. 14. World Health Organization. Open World Health Organization online course. Emerging respiratory viruses, including COVID-19 methods for detection, prevention, response, and control. 15. World Health Organization. Open World Health Organization online course. E-Protect Respiratory Infections. Module 2. How to Protect Yourself Against Acute Respiratory Infections. HTTPS semicolon backward slash backward slash open WHO dot org backward slash courses backward slash E protect dash acute dash respiratory dash infections backward slash scientific American does soap really kill 99.9% .9 of germs? World Health Organization, Open World Health Organization online course, E-Protect, Respiratory Infections, Module 3, Basic Hygiene Measures, HTTPS, semicolon, backward slash, backward slash, open, WHO.org, backward slash, courses, backward slash, E-Protect, dash, acute, dash, respiratory, dash, infections, backward slash, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Chemical Disinfectants, World Health Organization, Open World Health Organization Online Course, E-Protect, Respiratory Infection, Module 3, Basic Hygiene Measures. Michael Halsworth, Behavioral Scientist at Columbia University, via BBC, How to Avoid Touching Your Face So Much, Hill P, Stargazing Memoirs of a Young Lighthouse Keeper, Cannon Gate, Page 92. The Reading Agency. Reading Well Evidence Base. At https semicolon backwards slash backwards slash readingagency.org.uk backwards slash 
A D U L T S backwards slash impact backwards slash research backwards slash reading well dash books dash on dash prescription dash scheme dash evidence dash base dot HTML Hatfield twenty three Hatfield C an astronaut's guide to life on Earth page one oh three twenty four Ibid, page 104. First published in 2020 by Pan Books. An imprint of Pan Macmillan. The Smithson, 6. Brissett Street, London, EC1M. 5. NR. Associated Companies Throughout the World. www.panmacmillan.com. ISBN number. 978-1-5290-5450-7. Copyright C. John Hudson, 2020. The right of John Hudson to be identified as the author of this work has been asserted by him in accordance with this Copyright Designs and Patents Act of 1988. You may not copy, store, distribute, transmit, reproduce, or otherwise make available this production or any part of it, in any form, or by any means, electronic, digital, optical, mechanical, photocopy, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission of the publisher. Any person who does so, an un unauthorized act in relation to this publication, may be liable to criminal prosecution and civil claims for damage. A CIP catalog record for this book is available from the British Library. Visit www.panmacmillian.com to read more about all our books and to buy them. You will also find features, author interviews, and news of any author events, and you can sign up for e free new e-newsletters so that you're always first to hear about our new releases.